Welcome to another episode of Edge Grip Podcast. Uh, today we have a very special guest, and I'm just going to read a part of his resume before <laughs> before I say who he is. Uh, he began racing motorcycles at the age of six. He was the CEO of two, not one, but two electric vehicle companies, uh, Roar and Volcon. Roar? I mean, it doesn't have an engine. Why Roar? But never mind. Uh, he worked for Bonnier, which owned... I think 11 magazines, something like that. Uh, he was the vice president of Laguna Seca. Uh, so I, I hope that means free, free laps. Uh, he was uh, the managing partner of a company called Hard Card Holdings, uh, which did sponsorship management and athlete management, um, mostly for the racing, uh, the racing industry. Uh, he is a board member of the Motorcycle Industry Council. Uh, he held leadership positions in Ducati and Alpine Stars. Uh, and he also managed to do a year in MotoGP as a rider on a NSR RS 250R Honda for uh, Team Katayama, 1989. Can you guess who he is? Can you guess, Nabil? Well, my, that could be Andy Leisner. <laughs> oh, hello, Andy. The one and only. <laughs> what a guess. It's just on the tip of everyone's tongue, I'm sure. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and uh, there's one, I have to make one correction there, although uh, I am good friends with the, the leadership of Ducati and Alpine Stars. Um, I did not work for Ducati and Alpine Stars, unfortunately, uh, but uh, no, um, Gabriele, um, Jason, well, so. But, it was in it was in a press release that I that I took it from. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the first time Gal Research ever failed. Oh, really? Hmm. Well, really? the internet is up. always accurate, one hundred percent of the time. Yeah, I've been in and around <laughs> those those companies for a very long time. I was an Alpine Star sponsored rider back when Gabriele was uh, doing doing the sponsorships essentially himself, and now he now he runs the whole empire. So how are you, Andy? I'm well, thanks. I'm well. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for joining. We're excited of having you. So uh, do you want to start a little bit with the career and maybe some highlights and fond memories or fun memories? Yeah. Before, what's that? Yeah. What's that showy be behind you? Oh, that's the uh, that's the showy Andy Leisner replica back. Uh, I was sponsored by showy when I was racing and um uh, although they never, and I had a, a paint job that a, that a young showy designer actually put together for me, he made me a couple options and he did that one. And then, um, uh, uh I raced with it the years I was racing when I was done racing. And then, and then the, the president of showy just a few years ago, uh, I think that was an, that's an X 14 when, when that came out, um, he presented me with one in my old colors. So that was really, uh, uh really nice of them. Cool. Um, they're a great company, make great helmets, and um, yeah, it's a that's a, a piece I put on display. It doesn't get written much. That is cool, yeah, because there's only one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I went through a lot of those back when I was racing, um, but uh, yeah, I don't want, I don't plan to crash from that one. Right. Um, but as far as my but as far as my background, yeah, I I, uh, I I I grew up riding motorcycles here in Southern California. Um, my dad got me a motorcycle when I was six. He was a, he was a flat track racer and a scrambles racer and, and bought me a two stroke, a little two stroke chibi 60 to race, to ride at six. I was terrified of it. It was, uh, it was horrifying. It, it was a 60 CC two stroke Bridgestone engine, the clutch three speed with a clutch. Uh, every, all my friends rode Z fifties and I had this thing. They didn't have to have you use a clutch. Nobody uses a clutch now, nowadays at that age. Um, and, uh, it scared the pants off of me. Um, but, uh, I, I, the, the people I have to credit for getting me to ride it more and faster were, uh, a, a gentleman, two kids I rode with a guy named Tom Kendall and, uh, and the late, uh, Jeff Krosnoff and, and, and Tom and, uh, Tom went on to, be, uh, be a very successful car racer. We grew, we, we were, we were neighbors. Uh, and then we were also neighbors with Jeff and Jeff went on to, uh, become an IndyCar driver. Unfortunately, Jeff was killed in an indie car in 1996 but um but it was those guys if it wasn't for those guys ripping around on their z50s i probably would have parked my my 
my GB60, not, not ridden that thing anymore. So, um, uh, and then race motocross for, for a few years, uh, local motocross, mostly Indian dunes, Vianza here locally. Um, and then, uh, and then I was, I lived right at the base of the Angeles Crest highway. And, um, and when I was in high school, I had an RD 400 and we used to take runs up, up Angeles Crest highway. And, uh, one of the guys I rode up and down with raced and he said, you got to come out to Willow Springs sometime and try that. So, uh, did that. And I fell in love. Like most of us, yeah. I I accidentally took what I thought was going to be a rider improvement course, and it was racing school. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that because I don't read often. So I ended up same thing, trying it for a weekend with with uh, California Superbike and fell yeah. in love. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's Definitely. a it's a it's it's an, it's intoxicating and and uh, I, I I liked it because it it was it you know road racing as opposed to motocross which is just a lot of guts and physical you know uh fitness and such you know road racing was more calculating you know it was more of a math problem you know how you got around how you got around on the racetrack fast and uh and obviously you know you had to have some 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 riding ability but i just enjoyed sort of like the math side of things i love setting up gearboxes you know this is back before we had data acquisition so sat with a track map and a calculator and 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 a, and a rpm chart with all your different gearbox choices love that kind of stuff um and uh yeah but road racing road racing is great i i uh i think i finished like everybody um i was dead last in my first race but you know a couple races later it was winning what do you, what do you oh, mean wow. like everybody i didn't i didn't finish wow. dead last in the first okay, race well maybe not everybody <laughs> <laughs> finished fourth out of four wow that's fantastic out of four <laughs> oh out of four <laughs> yeah. yeah my my first race was uh CVMA, I think, and and same thing. There was a bunch of amateurs just getting into racing. So, you know, we got lapped by the fast guy, and then I lapped the slowest person when I was like second slowest. And that's fantastic. You know, nobody was going really yeah. fast. Yeah. Except like yeah. The first guy or two. Yeah. The blast still. Yeah, it's it, it's uh uh, uh it's great. And we, and we it was at Willow Springs, you know, but in, in Willow Springs, you know, you, I look back on that's a fast track fast 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 track you know and um you know on, on 250s our average speed was over 100 miles an hour a lap and and um so back you know 35 years ago we were going over 100 miles an hour a lap and um uh, you know turn eight was was wide open and top of six that you know that was it was it was um it was challenging but um really enjoyed it those were great days club racing um it's afm south awra those are long gone unfortunately um but no, good times. And you were one of the lucky ones that after after your motorcycle riding career took off or, you know, maybe wind down, uh, you switched to the business side of it and you made a career out of out of being in the business side of the motorcycle industry. Um, and you're, you're one of the lucky ones that have that experience from both both sides. You're your manager, but you're also a writer. You're a, you're a VP or a CEO, but you also know how to ride the heck out of what you're selling. So how did that, how did that transition come about where um, someone went like, Hey, come work, come work for us and, and let's see what you can do in the business world. Yeah, it was, it was a lot like, it was a lot like racing. I just was really determined, you know, when in 1988 uh, I was, you know, I was doing really well here in the AMA nationals and I was just determined to go to Europe and I didn't want to wait. And I, and I took a flight over to the Milan show in Italy, ICMA, which it is called now. And I just knock. I just met people and 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 got a ride for 1989. Uh, it was just determination. Um, and um, and then in you know, uh, I, I my racing career ended unfortunately in 1990 with a, a big crash at Daytona that left me um, at 23 years old with a hip replacement. Um, probably the youngest hip replacement <laughs> recipient ever. Um, but, uh, and, and that took me out of, uh, took me out of racing and I, I, but I was just determined to continue working in the motorcycle business and just, um, and just banged on doors. And actually the, the, um, you know, the, my two opportunities right out of school, good friend, um, uh, Ken Boyko, who, who worked for years at, at DG and then ended up founding Cobra Engineering, a very successful exhaust exhaust pipe manufacturer but i had when i was in the hospital i was in the hospital in daytona for 10 days and 
uh, in the same lap that I crashed just, just prior to me crashing um, was Gary, Gary Cowan crashed and Gary Cowan was an Irish racer who was right, riding for Kenny's team that year. And, and Gary was a, an amazing rider. Just I had ridden in the Grand Prix with him the year, year prior and um, amazing, amazing rider and a great person. And uh, he was paralyzed um, in his, in his accident. So Kenny was at the hospital for a lot of that time, uh, Kenny Roberts, and he, uh, he come up to my floor and sit with me and we talk a lot. And, um, so after I got out of, after I got out of, um, uh, uh, the hospital and a couple months later, Kenny called me up and offered me a job with his, uh, with his team. So I, I worked with his team for a year, um, and then just, uh, continued in, in the motorcycle business. And, and, um, um, I love it. It's just, it's such a great industry with great people. We're all in it for, because we're passionate about the sport. Um, you know, we're not working for a, you know, a toilet paper company where we're just in it because it's a job, you know, we're, we're, we're here because we love it. And um, I've just been really fortunate to have a number of great positions there. That's terrific. And then you spent, you did a year in MotoGP. How yeah. was that experience? Yeah. So that was 1989. It, it was interesting. It was, it was interesting, you know, over here in America, I, I was, you know, I was beating Cork Ballington who won four world championships and Alan Carter and, and Jimmy Felice, you know, who won a Grand Prix that year and at, at Laguna Seca. And I thought, oh, I can go over to Europe and it was, I'm going to clean up over there. <laughs> and he got over there and the Europeans were, you see it nowadays in Moto3 and Moto2. The, the young Europeans are so fast, so fast. And they've ridden all those tracks for years and I'd never seen them. And, and the, 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 you know, I, and I always, you know, uh, Keith code was a mentor of mine and, and I was always about getting the drive off the corner, you know, reference points for turn in, but just concentrate on that drive off the corner, get the maximum speed out on the straights, you know, so I jump on the brakes, you know, I'll never forget in Austria, you know, jump on the brakes and I'm breaking and, you know, August Auinger goes by me still under the bubble, you know, wide open, you know, uh, 50 meters later gets on the brakes. You know, so uh, they were so good at braking. They're so good at riding that front tire. And they and they are still are today. Moto 3, Moto 2. It's a, just amazing. So super competitive, um, super difficult. I was on a stock RS 250. My teammate, Denny Amatrian, was on a NSR 250, a factory bike. So um, stock bike was tough. Uh, and um, they would give 60 riders starts. So 60 riders would try to attempt to qualify for the 35 grid positions. And yeah. so just, just qualify. And every session was timed. So every session was a, was a qualifying session. And if you didn't go a little bit faster, every session, you'd go backwards 10 places. And this, the just making the race was just a, was just a, a bonus, you know, qualifying was, was the most challenging part. And, um, uh, it was it was uh, an amazing experience though. I, I grew up a lot, um, learned um, learned a lot of different cultures, traveled. Uh, this is before this is in Europe. This is before the Iron Curtain fell. We went we I raced in Yugoslavia. Um, it's a fascinating experience to see that. Um, it was um, just amazing experiences that really helped me sort of with life and business um, uh, beyond that. But but on the track. Whew, it was, it was, it was hard. You, you see, you know, and it gave me so much, it gives me so much respect. You know, I see Cam and, and, you know, Joe Roberts go over there and race Moto2. You know, people are thinking, oh my gosh, they're finishing, you know, they're, they're just barely getting into the top 10. That's amazing. That is an, that's absolutely amazing. Um, it is so challenging with all, with the, with the Spaniards and the Italians. And um, uh, additionally, the the you know you think oh moto two it's a spec class every bike's the same it's not the same you know all the chassis manufacturers have have a, have different advantages and the budgets of the team um, the engines may be the same but that's where it begins and ends um, so um, I I just you know for what Joe's doing over there and what Cam what Cam did um, especially with Cam's sort of jumping right into jumping right into the fire there that was super impressive we should all here in America be proud of that. Yeah, oh, I don't think people understand. Yeah, I don't think people understand what it is to go hop on a plane, go to a track you've never seen before, a team that you've never seen before, a motorcycle that you've never seen before that acts nothing like what you're used to, uh, and then you have maybe you know maybe that little pride of hey, I'm I'm a US champion, um, and then you know you you just 
it, it's very, very difficult. Not a lot of people did it successfully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it and, was. And you're, mm -hmm. Sorry, no, I'm saying, like you said earlier, competing with them on tracks they were born riding. You know, five year old, yeah. they're riding those trucks already. They know every little trick and shortcut you can imagine. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and if this asphalt's in the shade versus the sun, what to do on that corner? So, exactly. It's, yeah. it's almost an unfair advantage. We had this question actually a little further down, but might as well transition mm -hmm. into it now. Was, um, so you guys are doing great. We're so proud of them. But how do we get more American racers to get in the world championships? I mean, yeah. so there was an era, a golden era where us was dominating and then all of a sudden we're lucky if we get one or two riders in the top 10 yeah 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 i uh i it it, um, it moto america is doing great first of all moto america i i'm so happy with what richard varner and chuck axel and terry Carter have, have done with that have done with that property and um they've really transformed motorcycle racing here in america uh but still the competition level you know at, at moto america um, is nowhere near what you're seeing in the in the European Championships or just the Spanish Nationals or Italian Nationals, and I and I hate I hate to say it, and it, it, but the necessary evil is you've got to go over you got to go over there really young and just start racing CV or racing racing something racing a a Moto Three bike you know um, over in um, over in Europe and 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 it's also racing you know a, a true racing bike and not a not a production bike um, because they're so different. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, I, uh, I wish, I wish it wasn't, you know, in the old days you could run AMA Superbike, you know, like, like, um, Eddie and Freddie and everybody did run AMA Superbike and get dropped on a good 500 over there and immediately be up at front, but be up in front, but no one's getting rides going straight into 500, you know, straight, or it's not 500, <laughs> straight into MotoGP, you know, you gotta, you gotta win a Moto3 World Championship and a Moto2 World Championship and then, and then, then get, then maybe get into MotoGP. No one's, no one's going straight into MotoGP GP nowadays. So, and to get in a good Moto3 ride or Moto, you know, even a Moto2 ride, um, you gotta, you gotta just be seen over there, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, yeah. I, 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 I hope that would change. I, I was, uh, when I came back from Europe, I had, one of the, one of the things that amazed me when I was there is the Italian Federation, the Spanish Federation, they, they all ran teams in, in, in the, in the, what was then the 125 and the 250 world championship and, uh, for development riders, you know, giving young, you know, top Italian riders, um, uh, a shot, you know, I was racing against a guy named Fausto Ricci who actually did very well, um, you know, he rode, rose for, rode, rode for Team Italia. It was sponsored by the Italian Federation. And I talked to the AMA about it. I said, you guys, what we really need is we need an AMA-funded team over there that we can feed that we can feed our best riders into, you know, on 125s or 250s. But um, it's enormously expensive. And unfortunately, the AMA membership dues, we're not going to, we're not going to support, in, you know, endeavor, endeavor like that. Yeah, yeah to, that's to, to your point. And... Sorry, go uh, ahead, Gal. To, to your point, uh, so so two points. One is, yeah, you're absolutely right that they need to start on, on a Moto three, um, and you you see who's winning Moto America. Everybody that, or almost everybody that's winning, is a prodigy of the Red Bull Rookie Cup. Uh, yeah. So they they started young. Uh, and the second point is, uh, you're saying they're so fast over there, but when when someone comes over here, uh, they see how fast we are over here. Yeah, so, yeah. But I think yeah. it's and experience experiences. And we're pretty fast. Yeah, we're we are pretty fast. And I, you know, you look at Petrucci when he came over here. You know, um, uh, I thought, and he did pretty well. Um, you know, he had good good equipment though. You know, but he. Um, um, and the other thing is, our tracks are so dangerous compared to European tracks, and it's and it's a whole nother world when you come over here and you've got bumps, you know, there are no bumps in Europe. Um, you come over here and you get bumps and you've got, you got guardrails and walls and, and they're much, much better than when I was racing, but they're still, there's, they would never, you know, these, the, the majority of the tracks that we race on in the United States would never, ever be able to get homologated by the FIM for, for road racing, um, for any kind of world championship mm -hmm. event. Um, so, uh, Cost us at Laguna Seca millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars to move mountains, you know, to basically be safe enough for MotoGP. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so I think when the Europeans get over here and they see and they're running around next to walls, you know, it's it's, it's a little different.
a little different experience. Well, yeah. what's the deal yeah. with the noise in in Laguna Seca? You have to you have to yeah. change. Yeah. So um, back 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 when I was there, and I, and I think it's still the same, but. Um, Laguna, you know, the, the area surrounding Laguna Seca has very nice homes and they're, you know, people are building homes all around there. And, and the, the Laguna Seca, thankfully is a County park. It's a, it's a Monterey County park. And if it wasn't Laguna Seca would have been gone years ago. Uh, but it happens to be the highest, uh, revenue producing park in, in Monterey County. Um, so it's remained, it's remained a racetrack. Uh, but the residents that move in. They have to sign a they have to sign a document that note says I understand that five weekends a year there will be noise coming from this racing facility. You know, only five weekends a year are they allowed to be over a certain dB. Um, the other, right. you know, you, you got if you guys have done track days there, you know, you know you've got to have uh, quiet exhausts on your bike. So uh, the re residents sign this. Still though, you know, on those race weekends, uh, especially when MotoGP hit there, and those, and uh, that's the noisiest that that place has ever been when the moto gp bikes first hit laguna seca the uh we had to have one person on the phones just taking all the angry calls from the local residents about about the noise that was coming from the facility so um should, should have route should have route those calls to me the, the answer would be <laughs> shut up move out <laughs> it, it's like it's like buying a house in simi valley you have to sign that you know you're going to get cancer yeah so. <laughs> Or, you're, you're buying a you're buying a house next to a racetrack. What do you think yeah, is going to happen? I know, I know, but you know those are not those are not cheap homes, and and uh, the residents uh, didn't uh, uh, didn't feel well about <laughs> listening to that on weekends. I think it's music to my ears, but to them it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. So uh, talking a little bit about the Red Bull Rookie Cup, uh, Moto America brought it here. I don't think it's running anymore. And I, I, they did one or two seasons. Only. Yeah. It's yeah. It still runs. It, it'll still run in, in that first couple of years uh, was great because they had the, the rookies cup. They had the domestic and the international rookies cup and, and um, you know, uh, a very, very good friend of mine, JD beach, you know, uh, and the Hayden, uh, uh, excuse me, the um, uh, Gillum brothers uh, race that. Um, and it was great because it was on Grand Prix equipment. Um, and, you know, when JD went over, I think it was uh, 2008, I think, 2007, 2000, JD won the, won the Red Bull Rookies, the, the, the Red Bull Rookies Cup um, mm -hmm. International Championship in 2008, which was astounding. That's an amazing achievement because he beat a lot of guys that are racing MotoGP nowadays. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it, it it's too bad that it... it um, uh, we, we don't have that domestic version of it, um, on that equipment and, and that we are also, are not getting anybody over there on the international version of it. Yeah. That would be a good platform to get people maybe to race proper racing bikes and, and get noticed over there. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be great to have, uh, you know, a, a, a fleet of, uh, KTM motor three bikes that kids could ride here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then, uh, so on your own MotoGP career, any uh, crazy stories from the paddock? Oh, you're, you want to get it? You want to get into it right away? Come on. <laughs> <Get it early. laughs> um, yeah, they're they're um, uh, the, the 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 worst one for me was um, uh, uh, I never forget. I really started to finally get into the groove and learn how to learn how to ride the front end as hard as the Europeans did sort of mid season on. And, and I uh, just come off a, a, a really great um, Belgian Grand Prix at Spa Frankenstein. And we were, uh, we were at Rijeka. Uh, no, we weren't at Rijeka. Excuse me. This was later in the season. This was at um, 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 in um, Sweden, the Swedish Grand Prix. And mm -hmm. Uh, I had, uh, I had crashed a lot that year. I had crashed a lot. I held the record for most crashes in the world championship um, until a couple years later, Alex, Alex Curvier beat it. But, uh, but back then I think I crashed 23 times in that, that season. Uh, but in Sweden, I qualified really, really, really well. Uh, it, it, qualifying wasn't done yet. It was probably maybe the third session and I was firmly in the, in the, in the show and in the middle of the pack, which was really good for, for me and our, and our bike. 
and um, every, my team was really excited. Uh, and it's it, you, at Understore, you would do a you, we do plug chops. These are the days again before data acquisition. You do a plug chop uh, where you go wide open down a, down a long straightaway, and then pull the clutch and hit the kill button and kill the motor and then coast to a stop. And then the, the mechanic would look at the spark plug and, and read the, the ring around it, you know, around the electrode. And it could tell if it was running too rich or too lean, at least on the main jet. Um, the, that was the science of tuning back then. So we did a plug shop down a six gear long straight down, which was essentially an airport runway. And at the end, um, we couldn't coast all the way back to the pits. Normally you do it, you may sometimes coast back to the pits. But we had to stop there and we had to wait. And the uh, the uh, uh, truck uh, the truck would come, put the put a bunch of bikes in the back of the truck, and then and then they'd have ropes tied to the stakes on the side, and they'd throw they'd throw um, uh, ropes off the side for for other other riders to grab a rope and just get towed in. So you got a truck full, of maybe twenty bikes, and then you got a couple other you got a uh, half a dozen ropes hanging off the back with people hanging onto them, and it made a couple trips. So. Um, I tried to get up onto the truck and I couldn't couldn't get it. Uh, this all the ropes were taken, and at the very last minute, someone throws out one more rope. I I grab it, and then I and the truck starts to pull away, and I realize I've got the rope in my right hand, and um, the uh, I I didn't use the rear brake, and I didn't I didn't even my rear brake didn't work. Um, it just that was how I didn't I didn't want to ever touch it. Um, so. Uh, here we go, and I'm holding a rope, and I just uh, uh, thought as soon as this truck, you know, puts on the brakes for the first time, I'm going to the back of it because I can't grab my front brake. So I I try to do a a switch, you know, hand to hand uh, with the rope as it's as this truck is pulling us down the down the track, and um, as I do it, the the loop on the end of the rope catches my handlebar, pulls pulls the bike out from under me and I go sliding down the road and and the truck drives probably you know I don't know 300 meters down the road towing my 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 motorcycle on its side well everybody in the back is screaming and yelling and banging on the roof of the truck and it just keeps driving down the road with my motorcycle on it so <laughs> so I get it finally we get the truck stops and we get into the pits and my team is so excited uh, that I qualified really well or um, <laughs> they look at the motorcycle and it's completely destroyed. Uh, but, from... but they can still pull out the plug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they got a great plug job though. Yeah. <laughs> so were you able to race? Did yeah, well, actually I was not able to race because in the last qualifying session, um, Wow. I was uh, I was uh, uh, drafting Paolo Casali uh, down that long, that same long 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 straight. I needed to draft somebody to get a good lap time because my bike was slow. Uh, and I pulled out of the draft, and my poor friend uh, uh, Harold Eckel, um, German, was was just touring at the time, looking for looking for a spot, you know, to jump in and do a fast lap. And I went into the back of him at full speed and and um, top of sixth gear. And my my front brake hit his tail section. And I just went end over and end over and tumbled down the road. Um, and um, wow. and I got I broke my collarbone again. It was the third time or second time I'd broken that that season. And uh, but I'll never forget uh, uh, Carlos uh, Lovato, uh, former world champion. He came to my pit after you know sitting in my pit after the accident, and I was okay except for the broken collarbone. And he came up and he said, "Oh." Thank God, you know, Dios mío. You know, he said, "Oh, he said I saw this." He said, "I thought for sure, for sure that person is dead. For sure that person is dead because uh, he was behind us uh, when the accident happened." And, um, it wasn't your fault. It, 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 if he was coasting in front of you on a racetrack, it it was not your fault. Yeah, I know, but you know, that's uh, that that's the you know that was the thing, and it still happens today. You guys see this in MotoGP today. It you can't do you couldn't do in 250s back then unless you were on a honda nsr because those were the the fastest bikes but you couldn't do a fast lap on your own you had to do to do a, a good qualifying lap you had to get the draft to somebody so you were always it was like a chess match of touring around just trying to wait and look and find the right gap or find the right person to draft off of and then and then you jump under the bubble and just and just go for it and and um and uh you know guys um, I had the opportunity, I think it was his last season when I was there, uh, Anto Tony Mang, um, again, multi-time world champion. He, uh, 
he he had this amazing ability to just go around and just look look around and at, at like at twenty percent of the pace. You get it. You get in trouble for this now. But just putting around and then two corners from the end, he puts his head down and puts in a lap that is, uh, uh, you know, a record breaking lap. Um, and, you know, so of the, of the, of the maybe 15 laps he does in practice, maybe two are fast. The rest are at like a snail's pace. You know, it's, uh, it was really amazing to see the Europeans with that ability. Oh, interesting. And any uh, colorful stories on characters in the paddock? I mean, those are the good old days where you actually, people had personalities, no? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I remember, I, re I remember the, uh, uh, Kevin Schwantz that year, we, the, they gave, they gave all the top, uh, Porsche, uh, we were at, uh, where were we at the German Grand Prix and then went to the Austrian Grand Prix, I believe. No, yeah, I believe, I believe we were at the German Grand Prix at the Nürburgring, no, excuse me, uh, Hockenheim. And then we ended up going, um, to the uh, Salzburg ring, which is one of my favorite tracks of all time. Um, and, Porsche gave all the top 500 riders 911s to drive, you know, to make to make the drive up there in and um and so they all uh uh and I just remember um coming uh, uh I did very well in that race, one of my better races and we had a great night out, fun night out and I just remember coming back to the track to the motorhome and um and <laughs> there's there's uh Kevin's little Suzuki Samurai uh uh, with uh, with a rope rope toe on it, trying to pull his 911 out of this ditch uh, that he had somehow um, uh, driven it into, in the in the little Suzuki Samurai was making Evan no headway whatsoever. It was a samurai or sidekick. Um, he kept it in a trailer behind his motorhome. No way we were going to get that 911 out of there, but um, um, trying their hardest to to get that out of there before anyone noticed. Um. <laughs> It, uh, yeah nowadays yeah. everybody's uh being super sanitized yeah i've you, act you when know you speak you know randy mamola the, you, there was uh also at hockenheim there's a bar in the you know, the, the middle of the restaurant nowadays the gp teams are so isolated and nobody talks to either you know but back then it was pretty open the teams talked to each other some of us had dinner with other team team you know mechanics and things and um, it was it was a much more open atmosphere, and there's actual uh, there's an actual pub in the middle of the of the racetrack there, and I'll never forget you know Ray Momola having a beer or two you know the night before uh, the night before the GP. Um, that that stuff doesn't happen anymore. I remember trying to get a photo with one of the GP racers current, and we were at the after party, so that we had drinks in the hand. He's like, no, 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 we don't take photos with alcohol. <laughs> not even not even a person with him <laughs> no no he was uh, holding a drink too but oh he was thing. oh okay, okay yeah, we, yeah 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 we're supposed yeah. to portray a good example for the use so yeah. no alcohol yeah yeah randy mamola yeah. i think that was the most popular writer that never won a championship oh, he was so. so popular that year that i was there he was on the kajiva and um he uh, you know he would uh, he just do wheelies all the time in the in the crowd you could tell you could tell where well, at uh, it was at Assen. You could tell wherever Mamola was on the track because the crowd was cheering. You know, the leaders would be over here, but Mamola would be back a little ways, and you could the, you could hear the crowd cheering. You know, whenever he went past, it was yeah. The videos are still up there of him sliding and spinning the wheeling. tire up. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a fun style. So, um, now maybe then a little more about the the industry. You, you've um, You've been a leader in that industry for a long time. I mean, what what do you see happening? I mean, look you look at bike sales. Some companies are doing better than others. Some are pulling models, you know, or, or complete lines off of the uh, sale floor. Uh, electric bikes are a thing, mm -hmm. not yet a big thing, but you know, mm -hmm. it, it's. I now start seeing some of them around, but but bicycles more more than actual bikes, proper motorcycles. Yeah. Um, you know, what do you see happening in the industry, and 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 where are things going? Do you think? Is developing for the better. Um, you know, are we going to see a resurgence? And you know, are, are young people going to start riding bikes? Yeah, yeah. We used to study this a lot at the Motorcycle Industry Council when I was on the board there, and and uh, was on a I was on a committee we, uh, to try to uh, help grow the sport. It sort of morphed into what they call, um, uh, I believe, it's Ride with Us now, the um, Moto Intro, um, where they they take people and give them a quick little experience on a motorcycle, um, but. 
uh, what we what we saw, we were very worried about um, uh, millennials and that generation. Um, they didn't want sport bikes. You know, Gen X just you know wanted sport bike, you know, sport bikes, sport bikes, sport bikes, nothing but sport bikes. And and um, uh, and then all of a sudden, sort of the, the the millennial generation didn't want sport bikes. They wanted something else. You know, they wanted, and that's when we got sort of the retro. You know, some of the retro standards and you know standards became more popular. Um, so I was sad to see sport and race attendance dropped, you know, and that, that, that saddened me because, um, uh, you know, that sort of win on Sunday, the U S you know, win on Sunday, sell on Monday sort of went away. So that, that was, that was disappointing. Um, you know, off-road, uh, has, has remained strong. We had the, um, you know, we had the 2008 recession, which, which just destroyed our, our industry. Um, you know, we more than halved it in 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 the course of one year uh and then we you know we sort of clawed back after that um and uh and i'll never forget uh 2020 when uh in march april we were uh, in the mic board meeting and we we were just ready for the sky to fall you know we thought this is it this is 2008 all over again or worse um and um and the exact opposite happened which was great you know from from the power sports industry as as a whole you know not just not just street bikes um, so, um, but what, what I think, what I see is, um, one, we have, um, uh, uh I think that our biggest opportunity with the space right now and to get more people into motorcycling is happening very organically with the products that I worked on in the, in the segment that I worked in, in my last position with, um, uh, the lightweight electric segment. So these are. Surons, RARS, you know, that, that's the brand that I was the CEO of. And, and then Talaria, these are lightweight electric that, you know, some people call them e-bikes. They're not e-bikes. They've got foot pegs, not pedals. They go 55 miles an hour. You know, they're not e-bikes. Um, they're remote. The government sees them as motorcycles. Um, we have so many young people, you know, they're, they're nearly 100,000 unit sales in that category happening right now. So, uh, so many young people entering motorcycling through that channel where they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, enter any anywhere else and um uh you know they wouldn't they wouldn't go out and buy a street bike or a dirt bike and um they're maybe don't want to learn how to use a clutch right away you know um and on those things they just twist and go they're they're inexpensive they're light easy to ride fast um so we i i see that segment blowing up and and i and i really think we need to uh, the motorcycle industry shunned that segment a little bit, but now it's just it's starting to realize, hey, these are guys that are going into motorcycle dealers. They're buying a moto helmet. They're buying like an Alpine Stars, maybe a Duro jacket, some some moto gloves. You know, they're they're spending money in our business. They're learning how to ride a motorcycle. Um, let's convert them to uh, to be a lifelong motorcyclist. So that's something that I I want to I want to try to I want to try to work on. And and you know, we looked at um, creating. Um, you know, everything, everything I always like to try to do to work things into racing, but, you know, create racing series for these kids, you know, they want to go out and have fun and they want to go fast and they want to, they want to beat their buddies. It's a very, it's a very community oriented sport. They travel in packs, they ride in packs. Um, you know, we need to create some, some real racing properties for them. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, um, we set up uh, a RAR Mantis and Supermoto set up and there is nothing more fun and one of those lightweight electric bikes on a on a go kart track and supermoto setup. So um, that's my that's my hope for the future. Well, th that's actually a very good plan because also the the kart track tracks are more available, much cheaper to access. Um, I mean, you can literally show up, pay, and and, and start riding and yeah. share time with carts. Yeah, and 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 there's a lot of them. That makes it very accessible for people to to try to do something like this. If somebody was to do a series, some some organized racing series around a bunch of car tracks absolutely just just a deal and and the electric the electric the nature of electric power plants you know in this lightweight electric segment you know they make no noise um they uh so you can ride them in places that you couldn't you know we used to set up a little course in the parking lot and rip around our parking lot and and uh, mm -hmm. no one no one would care you know so um that's the other thing um you know racing road racing unfortunately um you know, you got to get, you got to load up the van and you or, or the, or the, you know, pickup or whatever and drive an hour and a half out of town, or at least we do here 
in Southern California, um, you know, to get to, uh, to go out and, and be able to ride a road race bike. But, you know, we can set up opportunities for people to ride um, here, you know, in, in cities. Um, I think it would, it would really help our sport grow. And are they buying them uh, for fun or are actually people starting to commute on those? Well, that's a great commuting solution. It is the the un, the the problem is you know Suron created that category, but sort of by accident they made this funky thing you know back six years ago that it wasn't it wasn't a motorcycle it wasn't a full size dirt bike but it wasn't an e bike either, um you know it had foot pegs and and it used some mountain bike parts and um, uh so um it's it's not legal on the street one hundred percent not legal um no matter what anybody says. Even if you put mirrors and lights and turn signals on it, it does not meet National Highway Transportation Safety Administration um, laws whatsoever. So um, uh, those are not legal on the street, but we see that's the kids ride them on the street. They ride on the street to the to the, the dirt lot where they set up a little, they build a little track, you know, and rip around on. Um, uh, that's why we were, we're in, the, in the development of the Rar Mantis S, which is uh, the first street legal lightweight electric. So just like, you know, that same platform, lightweight electric off-road, uh, but it will be the first one ever that we'll be able to get a, a license plate on and be um, fully DOT legal to be uh, registered. Um, so, but I think that um, um, when that happens, um, uh, the it's, it is a great commuter bike for riding to school. Well, you know, my daughter's high school here, there's, there's a half a dozen of those you know, Surons, um, you know, chained up on, on a fence out in front of the school. Kids just use their commuter to school and then, and then go up into the hills and rip around on them after school. Doesn't sound like a bad day. No, no. <laughs> well, great. And um, what are you, in terms of like the more traditional segment um, of, of, you know, combustion engines, but what do you see the challenges are these days for manufacturers? Yeah, I think that um, uh, I think the manufacturers are doing well with the products they're bringing to market. They they understand the challenges with the, with um, the the bringing young people to market, and I think they're doing an extremely good job uh, at building at trying to build products for for the younger generation. One of the one of the problems is you know with the the big at least the Japanese is that to develop a new product, you know the the product development life cycle and the and and the and the accompanying. Uh, expense to bring a new platform to market is outrageously it's long and expensive. So, um, you know, three to five years and, and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, you know, that's why a lot of this stuff is just, is things that have already exist in Southeast Asia platforms that already exist in Southeast Asia that they're finally bringing to the U S. Um, but I think they're bringing good product, you know, here's what we got with the, with the three hundreds, you know, the, you know, if I was to buy a, a motorcycle today that, um, uh, maybe I used to run around a little bit and then it was my track day bike. It would be a, it would be a Ninja 400 for sure. You know, 100% for sure. That is the, that is the most enjoyable, uh, I had an opportunity to ride one at, at, at um, uh, Chuck Walla and is the most enjoyable thing to ride around there. Um, uh, so um, I think they're, I think they're doing, doing well. It's just one, it's uh, educating, um, it's education. It's getting people that first taste of it. When I was growing up and probably you guys as well, you know, everybody has a story about riding their friend's mini bike and, uh, or their friend's dirt bike. And, um, and if you didn't whiskey throttle it and crash into a fence, you, um, you had an amazing time and you were, and it's intoxicating. You get hooked and you want to, and you want to do it again. Um, so I think just getting more kids that first little experience, and that's what the motorcycle industry council is trying to do right now, get them that first taste of it. It's sort of, it's sort of like being a drug dealer. You give them the first little taste of it and they're just going to want more. Um, I think that's, that's a, that's a big, uh, and, you know, but then there's other hurdles to overcome, you know, and one of the biggest ones is in cost of insurance, you know, insurance is, you know, the insurance cost is as much as your monthly payment on a, on a small motorcycle. So, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of challenges. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, so, and it's, it's, okay. not, it's not our fault though. You know, it's, it's the cars are getting more expensive. So everything around it is getting more expensive. Yeah. So I, I had before my current truck, I had a 2006 F 150 and insurance was dirt cheap. And then I got my 2018 in 2018 and insurance was outrageous. And I asked them, you know, I, I've, I've never had an accident in my life. Why, why don't I pay so much insurance? And, and the guy went like, 
Do you have a backup camera? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. All the little stuff on it. Yeah. yeah. All the little stuff on it. That That's yeah. what's expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Those are repairs. So if the Ninja 400 is a good gateway drug, uh, why no R6? Because that will be the next logical step. Yeah. You know, yeah. Making, you know, they're making a new one, right? I mean, well, they're not making a new one, but they're selling it again. It's just not street legal. Oh, yeah, yeah. just the race one. Yeah. And you can get it yeah. here only in Europe, I think. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm yeah, sure. If you got, I'm sure if you got them a check, they'll, they'll ship you one. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that I think Moto America has done a great job with the Twins uh, Cup there. You know, that that's a great, you know, it's a, uh, it, it's I'd love to see Moto 3 here, but that that's, you know, um, um, Twins in the in the and the 300s, you know, those are great entry points into racing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, six for, for decades, you know, the smallest bike you could race in a national was a 600. And, and that's, you know, that's still, still way too fast um, for, uh, for a beginner. So I'm glad to see, yeah. I'm glad to see that there. Yeah. I, you know, I just like to, I'd like to take it even down one more notch, you know, and it's just something that, you know, one of these lightweight electrics, they only have 11 horsepower. They, um, um, if anybody's been to American Super Camp, it's basically riding like riding a, a TTR 125, um, but with a lot more torque. Um, and uh, anybody can ride it, you know. It's the beauty of that bike is you know, you put you know, you put um, you know, someone like uh, you know, JD Beach on it on a little on a little piece of dirt and and he can have a blast on it, but then you put someone who's never ridden a motorcycle before in their life and you put it down into one of the lower level modes, ride modes. And they can putt around on it and have their first motorcycling experience without having to learn how to use a clutch. And um, yeah, um, yeah, I believe strongly in that in that product segment as an as a as an entry point here moving forward. Where, where is that battery technology going? And and can you pop the batteries now if you're doing if you're doing a track there or going on the track and you have like a spare battery charging while you're on yeah. the track? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you know, the batteries are batteries are swappable. You can you can swap a battery in less time than that takes you to fuel up a motorcycle. Only problem is the batteries are pretty expensive. Um, but um, you know, we would do at a track, we would do about thirty to forty minutes of really hard riding. You know, wide open, really hard riding, and then we need to, and we'd be down to about thirty percent the battery. And when you get down that low, it starts cutting your power. You know, so you need to swap out a you need to swap a battery. Um, and you can do that, um, um, but the you know the cost of the batteries is pretty high. But uh, but it's uh, um, definitely a way to do it. Yeah, we always whenever we did media events, we would have a bunch of batteries on char. We'd always have batteries on chargers, and and always be pulling batteries out and putting fresh ones in. Yeah. I mean, from a pricing accessibility, does the e bike and the battery cost less than let's say a Ninja four hundred? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's well, you know, it's it's, uh, it's close. It's it's you know uh, about five thousand dollars, you know, for for um, for that. So um, right. So that's not a bad setup. And no, and, and it looks like a great way to actually learn properly to race. You know, with with more torque, lower speeds. Yeah. Focus on turning and like you know, unlike what we did is you know go straight to a Ducati. Yeah, when, yeah. When you've never ridden a bike in your life, yeah. you go, "Oh, you got to get the eight four eight or you know, yeah. eleven ninety nine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Or I think, back. I think. I think the bill. You're a little out of touch with it. The average American, when you go like, "Oh, five grand. That's not too bad." Well, you I know, mean, compared to what other bikes you would start racing with, right? If you're gonna yeah. spend seven to get, I don't yeah. know what the Ninja four hundred cost, but yeah. usually they're around six, seven grand at least. Yeah. So if you got to spend that kind of money, you're still saving money in the, in a sense, and you don't yeah. spend money on gas. Yeah, 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 and the maintenance there's zero maintenance. It's chains, you know, chains and brake pads essentially, and that's it. Um, they're really, and you don't have to, you don't have to know anything about, you know, tuning to to ride one. They're pretty easy. You, know, so you can sus suspension set up. You know, you'd, you'd have to learn, but um, yeah, really easy. I remember the days back in the it was like two thousand six ish. You know, when when the first bike for a lot of new motorcycle consumers was a gsxr 1000 you know they wouldn't even have their motorcycle license yet and they go to a dealership and they put you know a couple hundred bucks down and get a get a revolving credit line and and ride out of the parking lot on the on the fastest sport bike made uh 
in a yeah, lot of woods. It was twelve grand. It was twelve grand with a yeah. really nice loan of six seventy five APR, something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Make the so payment. Easy. And they qualify anybody, and uh, uh, you can you could, if you could fog a mirror, you you qualify, and and uh, <laughs> and you pull out of the driveway at the at the dealership and grab a bunch of throttle and high side yourself and. And then have fifteen hundred dollars worth of bodywork damage. You gotta, you gotta pay for as well. Yeah. Where, where is battery so, technology going? Uh, are we are we going to solid state or what? Yeah. What's we've been hearing about it forever. Yeah, we'll go to solid state. We'll go to solid state for sure. You know, Hyundai and Toyota are are working on solid state batteries. Um, they they don't necessarily give much um, a range or, or, or a, a range advantages, but they they will be more stable. Um, and, um, so I think we'll go solid state. There is uh, so much money being vested, invested into battery technology right now that it is not going to be long before, you know, charging times are going to be greatly reduced and, and, and battery density will be greatly increased. And, um, it's, uh, we just have a lot of, a lot of big, investment capital groups spending a lot of money with labs to try to um when there's that much money behind something it's it's going to move forward for sure mm -hmm. do you see this coming coming in time uh for california because when when is california banning regular cars 2035 20, 2030 or 2035 yeah, yeah. something yeah. like that yeah. do you see that coming nice. in time or yeah i i um uh i don't think so um it's and one of the tough thing, you know, one of the really tough things for motorcycles, street bikes, and battery technology. You know, I own a, a Zero SRF, which I absolutely love. It's a fantastic sport bike. It is, it's, it is, it you know has so much torque, so so fun to ride. The technology is amazing, handles great. Um, I had a chance to ride one up in the Sierra Nevadas and twisty roads, and it's just um, with the Zero folks, it's just the most amazing. Uh, the most enjoyable motorcycle experience I've ever had, to be honest. Um, the um, but motorcycles, uh, a rider on a motorcycle going down the freeway has um, a, a significantly more drag, uh, air resistance, wind you know wind resistance than a than a Tesla you know that's in the lane next to them at the same speed. Um, you think motors oh it's a small frontal area it's not that bad but motorcycles are horribly un air un aerodynamic. And um, the the enemy of range is drag. You know, drag increases with the cube of speed. So um, the faster you go, the more drag you have, and the more battery drain you've got. Um, so motorcycles are not nearly as efficient at high speeds um, as as automobiles. And mm -hmm. and plus, they can't carry. They're small. They can't carry a lot of battery. You know, like you know, zero's got about eighteen kilowatt hours in there. But but that's. Um, you know that's about all you're going to get in there without making something really big and heavy and they are they are they are already a little chunky with that so um so motorcycles i i i i don't i don't see you know i'm a big proponent of evs we've got two electric cars here and i read a zero but i don't see the motorcycle industry being able to uh make a complete switch um to um ev uh to 100 ev anytime soon we're, we're and and i think that i think you know I think we're going to get some motorcycles maybe given um, uh, more lenient uh, paths towards the EV conversion timeline. You know, um, we did that with emissions, you know, motorcycles, I guess California really cracked down on emissions. Uh, cars really, really cut their emissions. They put big catalytic converters on them and the motorcycle industry, um, thanks to the motorcycle in people like the motorcycle industry council, you know, sort of fought that and, you know, a, a, a a thousand cc four cylinder, you know, put out considerably more emissions than any car on the road for for a long time. Um, so um, I think uh, I think I think that will be this, a similar similar thing to happen in in the EV world. And they're gonna probably grandfather all the existing models, right? You can't sell new ones. Oh, but... for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, yeah. That's why uh, that's why after. <laughs> Uh, the, you know, when they, when they did the red sticker, green sticker, off-road regulations for, for dirt bikes here in California, you know, where you couldn't ride 
you couldn't ride a, a, a competition motorcycle or a two stroke, you know, in certain months of the year, but anything that, that, that was uh, built before those green sticker regulations, you know, so you'd have these really clean, you know, TTRs and CRF Fs, you know, running around at Hollister Hills off-road park, you know, and then you'd have a 1977 Yamaha YZ 400 that's creating a giant cloud of exhaust, you know, you know, burn, burn through there. Um, but it was grandfathered, so it was fine. Yep. And still do that with cars. I mean, a car is 25 feet or more, yeah. then it, there's no car, there's no requirement to test it. It's just, yeah. uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank God. Yeah. 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 So I'm sure that, that will, that will occur, but, um, but yeah, I, I think that, um, um, you know, I was always, uh, you know, I rode two strokes my, my entire career. I love, you know, I love, love two strokes and I still love two strokes. Um, I wish they were around still. Uh, but, um, they were, um, now, you know, riding, you know, electric bikes almost exclusively. Uh, I just, it's really, really enjoyable. If, you know, if, if anybody listening has, hasn't ridden one, they should try it. Just the, the amount of torque that they push down is so intoxicating and, and it just, uh, um, the ride experience. I like to say it sort of distills motorcycle riding around down to its just simplest, most enjoyable form in that, you know, on a twisty road, um, you know, accelerating brake and cornering, um, you know, all you have to worry about is just gas and brake. Um, you don't have, you're not shifting gears, you're not using the clutch and you don't hear any noise. You know, the, all, the only thing you hear is the wind. Um, it just, you just get into this, this, feeling in this mode, you know, when you're running back and forth through twisty corners that, um, is, uh, um, I don't know, it's just sort of otherworldly. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Sounds like, uh, e-motorcycles then are the equivalent of, for this generation of what two strokes were for our generation hearing you speak yeah. about minus the noise, of course. Yeah. 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 yeah two strokes were a something whole... really, sorry, go ahead. Uh, two strokes were a whole different beast. You know, they were, they were so tiny and so light and the power, you know, and they were hard to ride, you know, they had, we, you know, nothing happened until you hit 9,000 RPM. And, and then they came, then they had hundred percent of the power. Um, but uh, I'll never forget uh, in, in 1989, I'd raced the Grand Prix that year. At the end of the year, Honda ran, uh, there was a Will Springs 24 hours, a 24 hour wear, wear uh, event at Will Springs. And they asked me to ride. They they brought an RC thirty over. It's the first RC thirty in the in in the country. And and um, myself, Randy Renfro, Rich Oliver, uh, Mitch Bame, who was uh, editor for motorcycles at the time. He ended he ended up going to work for Honda. Um, we we rode it. And Mike Spencer, former former uh, AMA Superbike racer, uh, who worked for Honda, uh, we rode it. And uh, and I had just come off as you know three years on. 250s i hadn't touched a four stroke and they bring the rc30 out which was you know turned into the rc45 and you know it 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 was and they thought oh this thing is amazing it's so good it's fantastic and i got on and i and i took my first stint out and i came in and i said this is a giant piece of junk this thing it's so heavy it doesn't turn fast it's uh it's hard to ride and um everybody couldn't couldn't believe that but um and it slows down as soon as you let off the the throttle. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. With the, you know, with the 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 two strokes, you know, we would just, uh, um, you know, we would at the end of the straight, you you grab the brakes and you don't use the clutch, you don't blip the throttle, you just, and you know, now we have auto blip downshift for four strokes, so it's easier. But but uh, back then you had to use the clutch and blip the throttle. But with two strokes, you just mash, you know, mat, pull up on the lever and just mash through the, you know, down through the gears, you know, and, and not worry, you know, not you zero engine braking. So it didn't matter. Um, um, yeah. But yeah, two strokes. It's sad that they're gone. They were, they were amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe we can talk a little bit about, um, and we've talked about favorite bikes already. You gave us a hint, but what, what, other things have you ridden that have charmed you in the past? Yeah. Um, I, uh, you know, probably my favorite road race bike ever was the, the Aprilia 250 that I, that I raced. It was just a spectacular motorcycle that was so easy to ride, so tiny and, um, you know, 198 pounds and just this wonderful 198 pounds and almost a hundred horsepower. It was, it was fantastic. Um, 
that was that was great. I think uh, I really um, really enjoy uh, on from a street bike perspective. I really, I really enjoy riding adventure bikes um, because they they really go well, you know, around corners and and super fun to ride on any twisty road. And then if the road turns to dirt they're fun in a different way. Um, and, and then you can get on the freeway and just be comfortable and cruise, cruise for 500 miles and not, you know, not worry about your wrist cramping up. So I think adventure bikes are a great, great, great platform, um, nowadays. And, and, um, and then, but again, you know, from a sport bike perspective, and I've ridden, you know, R1s and RSV4s and Panagales and, and, um, they're wonderful and they're beautiful and they're amazing, but, yeah, there's so much motorcycle there. There's so much motorcycle that, you know, nobody, nobody this side of a Moto America or Moto GP paddock can get all the, you know, can get everything out of those, out of those motorcycles. And, and thank goodness they have incredible electronics, attraction control and lean angle sensing ABS and everything or else, or else they would, they would be unrideable. Um, uh, uh, fun to ride occasionally, but I, if, 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 if I went to a track day and there's a Ninja 400 or, a, or, a, a, you know, a thousand CC four stroke there, I jump on the 400 any day. They are a lot of fun to ride and properly set up. They're actually amazing. Yeah. I, I've yeah. ridden some 300 and 400 stock. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. bad. Yeah. And yeah. then one that had the suspension done. And yeah. That was yeah. impressive actually. Yeah, because ground clear, you know, you run out of ground clearance on those things when, when you're pushing them hard. They, uh, that's true. The, um, but I, you know, everybody who who everybody who asks me says, "Oh, I'm thinking about getting a street bike, you know, first street bike." And I always tell them, "Get a, you know, get a 300, get a K, or get a get a KTM 390, or you know, a, you know, Ninja 400." It's, yeah. yeah, it's the way to go. And I got a I got a manufacturing question for you. Mm -hmm. How does uh, a supply chain looks like? You've been a CEO of two different manufacturers. How does yeah. the supply chain uh, for a motorcycle look like? I mean, there's there's probably thousands of parts and hundreds of vendors. And yeah. how do you coordinate them? Where where do all the parts come from? Uh, yeah. what, how do you how do you make the regulation work? I mean, it's it's I mean, it's it sounds like a lot of work for for. It, someone to to push a product like that to the market so how do you make sense of everything and, and how do you co coordinate everything yeah absolutely it, it is extremely challenging um especially for a small company um you know a small startup company like i like i've worked for uh and, and I'll, I'll use vulcan um i'll use vulcan as as an example because we were trying to build that here in america and source it with as many american parts as possible this is a vulcan grunt which is just a a, a play bike utility bike um very simple, but you know, again, uh, the the sourcing of of all the parts and components, you know, it involves a couple of years of testing components from different vendors, building some of our own, um, uh, you know, and same with the big OEMs, you know, they they only actually manufacture a small number of parts themselves, you know, they they mainly they mainly buy from outside suppliers, you know, same car business is a little similar, but maybe not as much so, but um, uh, but it, the coordination of, you know, you're, you're absolutely correct in the supply chain of coordinating um, all the uh, uh, production, quality control, timing, um, uh, maintaining adic adequate but not um, overstocked inventory levels of all the parts, um, uh, constantly uh, doing inventory management for uh, basically just production line efficiencies and also auditing you're you know you're getting audited on a regular basis and you gotta you gotta count every nut and bolt that's that's you know getting ready to be installed on motorcycles so it's it's a big it's a big process um it's a difficult process uh and there's and and it's giving me new respect for the folks that you know that that um specialize in supply chain management um smart 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 smart, smart people um Luckily, I I didn't have to do that myself uh, because it is it's 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 uh, it's not easy. Yeah, you think you know you look at the motorcycle you've got in your garage and you you look at all those parts and bolt nuts and bolts on it. You know those all had to come from different suppliers from all over the world and end up in one factory and sit there and be pulled up pulled pulled from a from a bin right at the right time and installed on the assembly line. It's um it's a big effort.
What's the staff look like in in both companies that you uh, were were CEO of? Yeah, yeah. So so at, at Vulcan, we were we were up to about fifty people. When well, this is when we were trying to manufacture ourselves uh, in Austin, Texas, and and eventually that got moved uh, uh, moved to Mexico uh, with a with a third party manufacturing partner. But um, you know, we built three assembly, you know, th- uh, three lines for assembly. Um, and there were there were about um, a dozen people on each line, uh, maybe ten people on each line that were uh, building building motorcycles. Um, uh, in as, as far as RAR goes, this, the all the manufacturing is done in China. Um, there's a big team over there, though. There's 35 people that work for our that help do our R and D and and um, product development and, and manufacturing. Uh, so it's and those are just very small, you know, small volume companies. You, know, you think about a company you know, putting out a lot of units um, and, you know, the, the factories run, you know, almost 24 hours a day, you know, 365 days a year. Yeah, it's an amazing operation. I had the chance to visit uh, Ducati um, in Bologna. And yeah. They gave, gave us a tour of the factory uh, and they had an interesting principle. Uh, so they got people working on assembling a certain part of the engine, right? And, and mm-hmm. they have this workstation and the bin comes behind you with the appropriate parts and the tools are hanging right above where you need to do the job. But which surprised me when we deemed that specializing in the task makes you keep making you better at it. They actually move people from workstation to workstation because they realize that people get bored and they start getting sloppy yeah. and get injured if they're doing the repetitive same work over and over and over again. Yeah. And so they had like, you would do three or five stations a day yeah. if you were working there and you work your way down the line with the engine that you were building yeah. all the way down, which was surprising to me. I mean, did did, did you guys do something like this or yeah. were you more like, you know, you're going to assemble a clutch and that's all you're doing, well, not the electric clutch. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, it was it was very important, though, to have to have specialists, you know, OK, this guy is the is the uh, is the rear wheel guy. You know, all he does is put the distance sprocket on the rear wheel and then puts it on the motorcycle. And and we had at their stations, you know, every every um, every nut and bolt had its own tool and it was preset. For, the, for that torque setting. You couldn't change the torque setting on the tool. The tool is set for the torque setting for that particular nut and bolt hanging from the ceiling. Um, you know, I've seen some other factories where where they basically, another method, they put all the parts in a circle and they put two people together in the middle and they, and they build the motorcycle up from there and a lot of errors get made because they got to do everything, you know. And, uh, you know, when you have, when you have uh, people concentrating I, I got- on... I got one of those in the garage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> My father had a Pomoda, and yeah, yeah, it was uh, just you had to drop the front end of the mo- of the bike out of the or drop the uh, uh, drop the engine out of the bike to change the oil filter. Yeah. Um, oh, wow, uh, that's convenient. That was a long time ago, but um, uh, yeah, it, but you know the, what Ducati does. Ducati does two things really well. They do that thing where they move people and and keep them fresh, and you know um, we didn't do that. Um, that's great. And now the other thing Ducati does well is a lot of coffee breaks. I've been to that factory and there's a <laughs> lot of coffee breaks. And so a lot of, uh, and you know, it's Italian coffee, you know, it's espresso. So that probably keeps them sharp also. Oh yes. The productivity is going to be through the roof there. Yeah. You know, espresso <laughs> was invented. Espresso was invented in Italy, especially f- to make coffee breaks of workers shorter. Oh really? Oh. Yeah. The guy that invented the first machine, he had it. Yeah, I think he had a factory, and his worker took too much time making coffee, so he invented that machine to make coffee quickly. Yeah, concentrated. Yeah, yeah. In a short cup. Yeah, yeah. Get That's back to one. work, Giuseppe. <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> there was a That's famous. A big... uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever read it. Uh, there was a famous HBR Harvard Business Review article mm-hmm. about Porsche manufacturing. Mm-hmm. And they used to be, and I think that must have been late eighties. They were horrible in manufacturing. The, the factory was a mess. The QA was terrible. They, every, it was something like seventy percent of the cars that exited the production line needed some sort of rework. Yeah, they had this massive Easy parking problem. lot where they would put the car and then put a note on them that says, "Okay, here the mirror doesn't work, and here they're missing a wheel." Oh, and they would yes. go back and rework them. It was expensive, and they rebuilt everything from scratch. The entire assembly chain, the computerized systems that went directly from their assembly line to the providers of the part so that 
the guy who made a, a red door knew he had to deliver a red door on this bay for that assembly line at that day at that time. And things came in sequence and they were able to do a red car and a blue car and a green car because the parts were coming in at the right time and they were sequenced correctly and everything was computerized. I mean, it, it's a famous story because the amount of engineering and thinking and math yeah. and communication oh, yeah. that got built into this was was pretty groundbreaking. That's that's I'll have to look that up because that's absolutely fascinating. We uh, our 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 lines and our processes were designed by a guy named Bruce Riggs. He was our CEO. Bruce is the is the CEO right now of, a, of an e-bike company called Monday Motorbikes. And Bruce is a he's the smart one of the smartest people I know in the world. You know he's he's a genius. Um, and um, and you know he's the one who designed all those systems because not only is is it um, you know the assembly but all the accounting behind it again of the of the inventory coming into the building. And then we had an offsite warehouse, you know, the inventory coming to the offsite warehouse, come into the building, go onto a car, things are getting scanned at every at every step along the process. And and um and and uh Bruce uh, Bruce designed all that and um he's the, you know he was a genius. Yeah, yeah inventory questions. counts against you on in as a liability when you Absolutely. do your, uh, don't, tax. I don't want to have a lot of it yeah. sitting in the warehouse, that's for sure. Yeah. 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 Oh, there's how, a famous you book manage... about it by uh I think Eli Goldstein called the goal uh one of my, my early in my career my, my manager made it meant a reading and it was about the same thing manufacturing getting bogged down and they couldn't figure the constraint points and they had inventory building up in front of every stage of manufacturing so it was costing them a lot of money yeah. Yeah. they were operating at the slowest and and the way the guy figured out how to optimize things is he was walking with his kids in a in a scouting trip and he saw how like the line would stretch, they would they would start within two feet of each other's working in Indian file. And then the line would stretch over time because somebody's slower, somebody's faster, somebody mm -hmm. stops and ties their shoes, you know, slows down everybody behind them. And then he tries to catch up, but the gap never closes. And all of a sudden, the ma the, the line is a mile long. I and there's, see. there's yeah. huge distance. And he's like, okay, this is our problem. The machines don't operate at the same speed at every stage of the process. And so when you're trying to put something through, it, the slowest machine is going to dictate how things go and it's going to slow the guys in front and the guys behind. And so they started working on equalizing this. And it's it's a fun book to read because it reads like a novel. So it's the adventure of this guy who gets hired into this factory mm -hmm. that that is in dire straits mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and how he tries to fix things and can't figure it out. And yeah. they, they reduce inventory and negotiate prices and do all that stuff. And they're still sucking up tons of cash. Yeah. And then yeah. he goes like, aha, and he gets that spark of, of uh, an idea yeah. when he sees that line of, of yeah. kids is walking. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's not as, <laughs> for me, it's not as, ex obviously not as exciting, probably for all the listeners, it's not exciting as racing motorcycles, but it's, it's, um, it's fascinating to me uh, nonetheless. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you know, that's when the, our boring day jobs come in. And... <laughs> <laughs> I, I was so going to ask about how, racing. How did you, sorry, I, I was going to ask, Go how ahead, did yeah. you manage 2020 with the chip uh, shortage? Yeah, so um, uh, the, we were uh, Vulcan was spun up at the start of 2020. Um, that's when I was the CEO there. I was the I was employee number one at Vulcan, and, and basically, so 2020 was us building was building that team, and we had um, uh, we were trying to source as much as we could in in the states, and uh, we had some um, supply chain stress. From the chip shortage, thankfully, our you know our motor controllers were the only thing that really you know really had um, a lot of tech in it. You know, it was a pretty simple motorcycle. Other than that, um, so we weren't affected too badly, but it, but it did it did slow production down as it, it was worse sort of post pandemic um, when when uh, not post but on the backside when we came out when. Demand was so high from every, you know, from every sector for componentry and chips, and and um, and the uh, the those component companies couldn't scale up fast enough. Um, that that was that was the more difficult point. It's just now really finally sort of settling down as far as you know, si su you know, supply and demand, and you know, from component companies, co component and chip companies like that. Uh, let's, let's touch, let's touch, let's touch marketing. When you were at Bonnier, uh, I'm sure you were in 
<clears throat> you had good connections to all of the manufacturers and and asked them for motorcycles to test uh, and gave them you know gave them the spiel of hey, I'm just mm -hmm. gonna I'm just gonna give you more marketing right uh, now now you're on the other side uh, are magazines still effective how do you go about uh, marketing strategy yeah that's a great question because I, I I've I've seen it go uh, complete a, a massive change in in the in the from the marketing side from the media marketing side the PR side uh, my first job really in the motorcycle industry I was going to UCLA at the time and I was racing motorcycles and I and I I used to stop I would ride my I was riding an RZ350 to to UCLA along Sunset Boulevard if anybody's in, from Southern California they sort of know that route and I would stop at the at the Peterson uh, Peterson publishing offices that's that, that's who produced motorcyclist and hot rod and you know a, a bunch of uh, enthusiast publications so and i would stop there and and just bug uh uh nick i notch and and mitch bame to let me do something for them and you know and i did odd jobs for them and then they finally um let me write a little bit and and uh and then be a photo model uh for them among a lot of old covers of motorcyclist from the 1980s um so that was when that was when uh magazine publishing was at its you know everything was magazine there was no digital and um the manufacturers would would really work so hard have big teams to make sure the magazines were supplied with fleets of motorcycles to test um they would you know suzuki would would deliver a motorcycle and let the magazine have it for a full year just in hopes that it would show up for other stories oh they're going to test an exhaust system maybe they'll use one of our our motorcycles you know they they um uh it was just hoping for exposure in the magazines and and a little bit of good coverage and um and that, and that was it that was all there and then you know when i took over uh uh um i, I worked for psych world in the 90s as selling advertising and then i was brought back as publisher in 2010 and um uh it was just when when we were when digital uh the internet was starting to become more powerful and digital marketing was happening social media hadn't really taken a strong foothold yet but um uh, we still were were getting um you know magazines were the number one way to get good um uh, good exposure for motorcycles, especially in big road tests, you know, comprehensive road tests where, you know, at, at Cycle World, Cycle World did the best road tests of anybody. You know, every single bike was run through, you know, quarter mile testing, zero to 60, zero to 100, braking, top speed uh, testing at a secret top speed testing ground. Every single motorcycle that came through there, it would be weighed, it would be dynoed, it would, um, um, you know, that the, for a consumer could pick up a magazine and get every single piece of information about that motorcycle. Um, unfortunately, now, uh, as you know, sort of uh, attention spans got shorter driven by digital publishing, um, you know, there's still some, you know, tests, like quote unquote tests happening of motorcycles online. They're nowhere near as exhaustive or as extensive as what it, as what they used to be. And then, and then social media has taken over as well. And, and now, and now the motorcycle companies are looking more for just impressions rather than, than coverage. You know, I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, what we, we, you know, we still supplied um, folks like motocross action, you know, this is in the off-road world, but motocross action, dirt bike, they're still doing really good tests uh, of bikes, but you know, at the same time we're, you know, we'd be sending bikes to influencers, you know, and just hopes in, in hopes that they'll make a Instagram post um, with our bike in it. Um, celebrities, you know, we send bikes off to celebrities and just pray that, that maybe they show up and, uh, you know, uh, we had, a we had, uh, committed a couple motorcycles to a famous, uh, pop artist, um, and, um, a front wheel showed up in one of his posts and that's all we got, but but you know, that cost us two motorcycles. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, um. It's it's changed a lot, and and I don't think it's changed necessarily for for the better. There, there's not as much good information about motorcycles out there as as there as there used to be. Uh, but you got to play the game. You got to you know as a marketer, um, you've got to be where be where the eyeballs are and fish where the fish are, and that's where they are. Yeah. But I remember reading articles where you could actually get a sense of how much fun the bike was or wasn't to ride from from the writer. 
Yeah. And yeah. and describing and doing some comparison and what they like. And, and you were able to make an informed decision even sitting at your house. Because typically you take a bike out for a ride. I mean, unless you're in Southern California, most states, you're going from red light to red light yes, if yeah. you're testing a bike. Yeah. You don't get an impression yeah. of what the bike's going to feel like. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and the the really eloquent writers did a great job at yeah. explaining, you know, from their expert point of view, what's good about it. And I miss that. Yeah. Yeah. We used to, we used to take any, almost every motorcycle we got, whether it was a cruiser or a sport bike, you know, it would do, it would do a day of street testing. It would do a day in local Canyon roads of, you know, uh, um, you know, twisty sport street testing. It would, it would go to the drag strip. Uh, it would go to the top speed testing grounds and it would go to a racetrack also and go and do laps around a racetrack and gather all that information and talk about the motorcycle from all those different, you know, all those different um, points of view. And, and nowadays, you know, it's maybe, uh, you know, someone uh, nowadays, the, the motors, the, the OEMs uh, don't lend bikes out for as long. Um, so, you know, a, 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 a media company, a digital media company may get a test bike for a couple of days and they got to cram, you know, cram all that into, you know, all the photography and testing into a couple of days. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's changed quite a bit. There's also so, so little people that I trust to tell me how the bike is and social media influencers are not them. Yeah, I know. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go and figure out if, if I like a motorcycle from, from a YouTuber yeah. or, or from a pop artist. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to a motorcycle that Nick Einach tests or yeah. Randy tests, yeah, or Road Racing World test, and yeah. and that's gonna get my information. But I, I'm aware that we we are not, you know, we're not the rule. We're the, we're the exception. The rule takes takes their media from you know from their phone where they get it. Yeah, yeah. They, you know, guys like Nick and Don Kinney, you know, who worked who was the test rider for cycle for years. You know, Don won some endurance championships. You know, Don could go out race uh, and and Don was an amazing individual. He would go out and in in he would do one warm up lap and he would do six hard laps on a on a motorcycle and he have, he will have gone as fast as he could go if he kept riding laps all day long. He had done his fastest lap already. <laughs> it was he was he was just like this robot that could test so well like that. And, but then, yeah, he just, you know, on the weekends, he'd jump out and go win, win or wear endurance race, you know? Um, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't have that anymore, but it's, it's also good to get the, get the, the perspective of a, sometimes those guys only looked at like what it does from a sport perspective. But, you know, a lot of the people who come to motorcycling for the first time, they want to know like how easy is it to just ride around town? Cause that's all they're going to do. So we did miss a little bit of that. Cause everybody, every moto scribe was a, was a, you know, a, a hot rider, you know, to get around a racetrack really well. Like you had to, to be a motorcycle journalist, you had to be able to get around a motorcycle, get around a racetrack really well and shoot photos. You had to shoot photos. Um, if you could do those two things, yeah, you could, you could, uh, you could be a motorcycle journalist. Well, speaking of testing bikes, so uh, that was really the first time I got shocked. So I lived in Miami, um, but I would get my sports bike in LA and uh, ride the Harleys in Miami because it's flat and straight and yeah. you need a radio and other things to keep you busy. Uh, but I was shocked. Like, you know how you go to a car dealership and if they let you test the car, they're going to put the, the, the sales guy right next to you and you go around the block and you come in. And I go to Ducati Beverly Hills here and the guy goes, well, here are the keys. Take this you know, Penny Galley, and then here's how you get to the canyon, and then you go up, and it should be like a 45-minute ride up the hill, probably take another 45 minutes to come back, so we'll see you in about an hour and a half. I'm like, you don't know me. I just walked in here, and yeah. you're trusting me with a $25,000 motorcycle to go ride the twisties, and that's your, how you're selling bikes. You're like, yep, that's what we do. I'm like, that is yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, what that a would wonderful, happen. wonderful experience. You can do that at a Ducati, maybe a BMW dealer. It may not happen at a, you know, at a multi-line dealer somewhere yeah, else uh, right? a big yeah. box guy yeah yeah, oh, yeah in, a lot of, in a lot of places and for decades you couldn't even test ride a motorcycle you know they just test rides were just it just weren't allowed that was too much liability um but. yeah yeah well i was driving with this to comment of from uh, gal i put on the list here was you know your thoughts on the dealership model because there are talks you know like tesla about going direct yeah yeah, yeah, it's something I've been very close to, and it's very challenging. Um, but uh, and it and it's something you know the research you know that we did with the Motorcycle Industry Council and 
uh, you know, the dealership model it was great for my generation, for the older, you know, I'm Gen X, you know, the boomers above me, like, you know, we had no problem going. I used to love going. I used to hang out at motorcycle dealerships. Like that was where I went and just hung out there, you know, but nowadays, you know, younger consumers, especially Gen Z, they don't want to, they don't want to walk into a retail establishment. You know, they, they, it's just not, that's not how they shop. And they, you know, especially in a product that they're unsure of and a little bit scared of, you know, a motorcycle dealership experience is not the experience for them. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the problem though is uh, it would be great to be able to sell motorcycles direct to consumer um, through, through like Tesla does in some, but not all states. Um, but the, the main reason is it's illegal. It's uh, dealer franchise law in the majority of states in America prevent motor vehicles being sold direct to the consumer um, and not through a dealership. Um, wow. So uh, through a fan franchise, independent franchise motor vehicle dealership, um, Tesla has skirted that law in most, but not all states um, by uh, saying, and this was originally set up so the manufacturer wouldn't compete with their dealers. Um, Tesla has been able to do it though, because they said, well, we don't have any dealers. We're a new company. We don't have any dealers. We're not competing against anybody. And, and, and plus they had a, they had a, you know, a fleet of attorneys, you know, the, uh, that went into every state and beat down these, these dealer franchise law walls. Um, so Tesla was able to do it, but, but, you know, for a company like, you know, say, you know, American Honda, you know, they can never, it's, it's prohibited by law for them to sell a, a vehicle, motor vehicle, whether it's a car or a motorcycle direct to a consumer, um, and not use their, their dealership channel. So that's an unfortunate thing. I think it's something that holds us back a little bit um, in our business. Yeah. Although I think from an educational perspective, uh, dealers are a great place. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. Make, yeah. And you make friends. I mean, I've, yeah. I've made friends through that I rode with for a long time through the dealer. You know, they advised on what boots to get for this type of bike and yeah. and that, get that helmet. And, you know, they ask you the question. I mean, you have, you have basically a, your consultant there. And it's an involved sport. It's not like a car. You just get in and turn the key. Yes, you got to know yeah. the gear to purchase, what type yeah. of style of bike suits your riding, depending on what your plans are. I mean, there's a lot of back and forth that's here. That's true. And that's true. Yeah. I find it beneficial. I mean, that's... Yeah. But again, like you, we're, we're the older generation. Yeah, I, I it's like, very true. I don't like uh, negotiating, so I, I miss negotiating. You can't <laughs> negotiate with a website. You, that's it, true. It's the button that says buy now, right? Price is but, the price, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. If, but if you go in and you go like, oh, you got a, you got a bike on the floor from last year model. Yeah. You know, yeah. How, how much how much for me to take it home? Yep. Yeah. So yeah. That, that experience is, is something Gen Z, you know, they don't they don't like also. So yeah, yeah, yeah. They did they, they're they're not used to going in and, and saying, you know, okay, well, will you throw in a you know, throw in a helmet, you know, as well, you know, into the deal or something like that, you know. Yeah. 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 So why don't we talk a little bit about racing again? Um, I know we've we've beaten the manufacturing and business side a lot. Yeah, what's well, your it, what are your predictions? Put everyone for... to sleep with supply chain discussions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 but yeah. Those are fun because we're we're business geeks, so um, <laughs> maybe not for the audience as much. But what's your what are your predictions for uh, next season? Moto America, World Superbike, and Moto GP. Yeah, you know, and I and I and I hate to say this, but I don't follow World Superbike much anymore. Uh, Bautista, you know, I, I love to see Bautista do well um, because, yeah. uh, you know, because of his Grand Prix background, because, you know, he's a pretty, you know, he rode 250s back a long time ago, you know, so I uh, love to see him, love to see him doing well. But um, but uh, as far as Moto uh, MotoGP next year, you know, I, 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 I love seeing, um, you know, the, the Japanese, you know, the European manufacturers doing well. I love to see you know, Ducati doing well and Aprilia doing well. You know, I always root for Aprilia because that was the best season of racing I had was with Aprilia um, uh, back in the early, early, early days. But um, uh, I worry a little bit that it's going to be a Ducati parade, you know, next year, especially with Marquez, you know, on a Ducati. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, uh, you know, I, I wish... I'm really sad that Suzuki is is out of Grand Prix racing, and you know it doesn't look like they're going to be coming back anytime soon because you know they made an amazing motor. Suzuki has brilliant engineers that really don't get to flex their muscles a lot uh, as much as you know 
other brands and you know you, you look at what they built with that suzuki moto gp bike you know a couple of years ago you know that you know when ran one race is right up to the end there you know with alex rins um it uh uh sad to see that gone um you know honda honda's honda's been so dominant for many years it's you know it's okay for them to be off for a year or two i think um um uh, sad to see yamaha also struggling um uh, uh, were you around that when Dewan was around? Yeah, he, he my um, the my year in Grand Prix eighty nine that was his first year there. So he wrote he rode uh, Gardner Wayne Gardner was the was the 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 lead rider and Dewan was was the new guy there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that that guy is well, my my hero. I yeah, mean, he's amazing. He was you know everything yeah. he did without you know without moving his leg. You yeah, know what I mean yeah. He yeah. was the guy that invented uh, the thumb breaking. Yeah. And you know what people don't understand it's, you know, I, I haven't ridden a modern MotoGP bike, so I can't really say this. You know, I've ridden, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, V4, you know, Panagales and RSV fours and that kind of thing. Um, so that's about all, I, you know, as close as I've gotten to it, but you know, the electronics make it a lot easier uh, to ride. Um, but the, those, those 500 years, there were just the, when they were, when they were really, really making a lot of horsepower um, and no zero traction control and narrow pair of power bands, you know, end of the doing, you know, in the doing era there, they were really hard to ride, really, really hard to ride. And, and, um, and guys just getting high sided left and right, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was, yeah, he, 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 he was the one that moved to the big bang engine and yep, then everybody yep. went, Went to a big bang engine and then he went like, oh, okay. So now I'm going to go back to the, the old engine. Screamer. The screamer. The screamer. Yeah. And then yeah. you wanted that too. Yeah. And everybody were yeah. like, well, can't do anything about that. That's doing. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was, he was truly amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, MotoGP bikes nowadays, you know, you just basically get that thing into the apex and stand it up and whack the throttle open again i'm not trying to diminish what those guys do because they're so talented far more talented than i ever would have been um but um you know it's more uh more steering with lean angle rather uh, excuse me accelerating with lean angle rather than you know the more more fat of the more meat of the tire you have on the ground the more power it's delivering through that tire so um I'll never forget the first when when traction control first started to come in, and I was working at Laguna Seca. This is 20, you know, 2005 or two thousand six, uh, and Casey Stoner was on that Ducati, and he'd come off one two fives, and and uh, and I was standing, you know, at the apex of I forget which corner it was, somewhere in the infield there, and I I saw him. Um, it was the first time I'd ever seen this. You know, he he, he just run the thing in on, so hard on the front end, and then get to the apex and just whack that throttle, whack the throttle open, you know, which was, you know, a year or two prior would have sent you skyward, you know, and he would whack the throttle open. And then he just picked the bike up on the tire to, to, to picking the bike up and down, you know, adjusting his leaning on the tire was his adjustments to the throttle. And, um, I was like, wow, this is, he was, he was amazing with that. And, um, uh, I thought this, you know, the game has changed now. That's for sure. Funny, I was going to say Casey Stoner because I remember his last year, um, I think it was on the Honda, right? When he when last championship yeah. he won. And I, I watched him at um, on TV at, at uh, Phillip Island. Mm -hmm. And he was half a lap ahead of everybody else yeah. and just sliding all the time. Yeah, That yeah. tire was never gripped 100% yeah. to the ground. And he was in a completely different category. I mean, the, the, he was coming up with a bike already pointed on, this, on the slide and just shoot out and Everybody was just a spectator behind him, trying to just stay on the track and and catch up. And recently, I think he was quoted complaining about all the technology now and saying, "Well, you know, the yeah. fun days of pre-traction control and, and yeah. where you had a lot more things to do yourself were yeah. really difficult in fun days yeah. of racing." Yeah, I mean, you know, the years, you know, when Nicky Hayden was riding Moto Chibi bikes, you know, those were those were really, really, really nasty motorcycles. You know, no before traction control, that was. Tough days, tough days. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, some people, some people, uh, again, they say, oh, traction, we need to go back to the old days and no traction control. And, and, 
Uh, but the 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 with the amount of power that MotoGP bikes are making nowadays, it would be they'd be completely unrideable. You no one would be able to ride them with you know without without the electronic aids that are there nowadays. I would I would say keep the traction control on, but the aerodynamics take them off. That, yeah, that's what yeah. just is. It's yeah. just what what they're doing right now with the aerodynamics. It you know. It, and it I takes think that the the chassis alterations also you know the squat you know you you know altering the chassis yeah. you know on the corner exits and such um that's you know start you know began just with with the bike on the starting line you know and then and now every time they come off a corner you know they they um they squat that thing um i think that shape shifting the shape shifting era you know we're in that era right now and um that's a lot i think that that's something that can go away and no one no one will miss no, no doubt except the riders maybe <laughs> i mean they will be on it. equal footing anyway so yeah it doesn't matter much yeah, that was the main complaint of the suzuki's when they were doing motor gp the, the main complaint was hey we were we can't do the squatting like ducati yeah. did it yeah but uh well, hey, it hey in formula one too at some point when they banned the active suspension when during yeah. the Honda, you know, Prost, uh, Senna days, yeah, yeah, they were yeah. dominating because they had the active suspension and yeah. they had to ban it. Yeah. If you can't trickle, if it's not useful to trickle down the technology to street machines eventually, yeah, you know, then why? I mean, I, I love the fact yeah. that it's the, edge, the cutting edge of technology, but at the same time, do you really need a Ducati that squats when you're going to Starbucks yeah. or even, yeah. you know, riding a track day? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I all remember back when I was racing, uh, we spent some time at, uh, in Japan and, and it, we're sort of around the, that program with, um, uh, the, uh, it was the McLaren program with the, cause they're using Honda engines and those, those cars is right at the, at the early stages of, of semi-automatic gearboxes. And, um, you know, they were, uh, you know, not super reliable, still a lot of hydraulics. Um, but, they were at a point where they were using GPS on the cars this is a long time ago. And they're using GPS and they were basically were saying that we will, will these cars will just know where they are on the track and know when to shift and when to not shift. And they were, you know, even though that they, they were going to become automatics, but not by, you know, throttle or brake position, but, but, but the, by the car knowing what corner was coming up next and what, what gear it needed to be in and that kind of thing. And that got, that got squashed. Yeah. <laughs> They they built I think a few prototypes BMW of of an M3 that went through Laguna Seca all, all by its own. Um, oh right 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 yeah yeah, yeah, and they, yeah. They put they put they put a few journalists in there that were like you know shitting their, their pants because yeah. <laughs> it was it was going real fast but by itself. So yeah, I, yeah. I just said uh, I can't I can't wait for self driving cars to start showing up so I can I can cut them off on the road. Yeah. <laughs> see how they deal with that <laughs> or what is the what how do you neutral there's you put a cone on their hood there's something where you uh, like you put a you put traffic cone on the hood and it completely shuts the, the autonomous vehicle down is it i didn't know that because it sees the traffic cone and, and thinks it's a obstacle they've stopped for yeah i guess so i guess yeah. so i was i, I was at the jp 100 percent. we have it at the our battery car and many times more than I'd like on the highway, you'd be very close to the divider, and all of a sudden you're on a turn, and the car goes take over immediately, yeah. and uh, let's go of the autopilot. Yeah, and I think from an autonomous driving perspective, I you know I I think that we, we have it on our cars, and I think it I think it it's great for the freeway, but you know for full self driving on on city streets, it still it scares me a lot. I think there's just so many variables, so many variables. You know you know whether it's you know, a kid on a, you know, like I came around a corner the other day in our neighborhood and there's a kid laying down on a skateboard who had crossed the center line of, of, of the turn, you know, um, and, you know, stuff like weird, just weird stuff like that. That's not expected. I don't know if it'll ever get there, but, uh, and plus it's fun to drive. Like it's really fun to drive. Why, you know, I enjoy driving. I don't want to, I don't want the car to drive for me. Well, you're right. On the highway at traffic, it's a great aid because then you can do other yeah. things. Yeah. But yeah. other than that, driving is fun. That's the whole yeah. thing. Didn't I send you that article that, that I read the other day that Ford's developing autonomous driving cars so they can drive away from you if you miss a payment? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. yeah. It'll, it'll go back to the factory. Yeah. <laughs> they they filed itself. a patent. 
they filed a patent for it. <laughs> that was the story. Yeah. And I heard the rumor that was a kill switch coming, uh, becoming mandatory, but that was debunked. Uh, yeah. Randy Biden was pushing for it, and yeah, it's, it's not nobody wants it. Yeah. I it was in uh, it was the Japan Mobility Show uh, a month or two ago. Uh, I guess it was back in November, and the um, uh, Yamaha was showing off. Yamaha seems to have this technology down the best, but a lot of self uh, riding motorcycles, motorcycles that can you know stand up on their own. Um, they've shown it in a, they've shown it in in some proof of concepts and and now they had some scooters that actually did that so um you, know, you didn't have to know how to balance you know ride a bicycle and balance you could just jump on the scooter and it would balance for you pretty fascinating didn't they have a robot riding rossi's R1? bike or yeah, the R1, yeah, yeah. Or something like that yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah but they had they had a honda that would just follow you around and you would just walk and it would just an, an electric honda that would just ride yeah. behind you yeah, there were a lot of robot stuff. The Kawasaki had a robot, believe it or not, at the Japan Mobility Show, and it was scary looking. I'm I'm firmly I'm firmly convinced that we're going to be murdered by robots here, not in in, in the not too distant future. Um, after seeing some of the things they're doing now. Yeah, yeah. Where's Arnold Schwarzenegger when you need him? <laughs> uh, you know what? I keep hearing that, and and everybody everybody out there, just relax. AI is not what you think it is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> AI, it's, it's just reading the internet like you and Googling it and, and figuring out how to sound smart when it gives you false information. So yeah. AI well, is not until, at the point. Uh, until it's you've seen that uh, little robot. Boston dynamic dog, you know, the yeah. robot dog with a yeah. machine, you know, 50 cal machine gun on top. They communicate now between themselves. You know that. Yes, yeah. and In they fact. shoot. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and they compensate for recoil before they shoot. You can see the, the yeah. dog squatting. Yeah. And then the shot comes out, and then he straightens up afterwards. But not it's not. Thing. It's not real AI. It, it's just. It's just a lot of software. So re yeah. real AI is very little software, and and just modeling and and training on that modeling from a lot of data. So that that what they're doing is just regular software. Yeah. Yeah. AI is very misunderstood. Yeah, we. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. We we uh, we were trying to come up with some imagery for a RAR ad. Um, that we were doing, uh, and we couldn't, uh, we couldn't get the, sh we couldn't find the right people. We needed a certain type of person, and we couldn't find the people. We didn't have the time to get out and do a shoot. And, and our digital director, who's a great guy, and he's, and as he goes, he goes, let me have AI take a shot at this and see what we can, what we can get out of it. And so, and what he supplied back to us was was frightening. Um, it was frighteningly good in some ways, but frighteningly weird and scary in in other ways and and um there happened to be one particular photo where i told him i said you know this is the last thing that we're going to see here at rar before we get murdered by our ai our ai creations here is this is this dude on this rar here um but uh we didn't use any of it because it wasn't quite there but you know interesting to see we we have well, we have uh, on our Instagram account we have a lot of AI photos and uh, for anybody that's listening if you want to generate an AI just just go to Bing, log in, yeah, ask it right. for an image and yeah. it will make you an image. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, a good percentage of the questions in this interview were AI generated. Really? Huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, AI missed the Ducati and Alpine Stars thing, so. <laughs> Oh, I, I'm going to tell you where I, where I found it. I, I forget now where I found it, but it was it was in in some sort of uh, press release when you joined uh, when you joined uh, motorcycle industry console. There was a mm. press release mm. coming out, and it was in there. Interesting. So oh, yeah. False information probably yeah. was generated by uh, Washington by the Post. Japanese. Yeah, Washington <laughs> Post or MSNBC or Al Jazeera. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, great. Um, anything else we want to talk about? No, no. I'm I'm just uh, uh, just happy to be you know happy to be working in power sports. I took a couple of years off and worked in another passion passion industry of mine. Um, but uh, power sports is great uh, just because again the you know the, because of the people. You know, you guys you guys know this. Everybody. Yeah, you get you get to be on a podcast. And... 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, just appreciate you guys having me and, and, and hope, uh, hope we reach a lot of, a lot of young riders or people considering riding that um, just know riding a motorcycle is really, it's a great, it's a great form of transportation. It's a great form. You know, you ride a motorcycle to work, you get there refreshed, energized, ready to start your day. You sit and stop and go traffic in a car and you get there and you're, you're already bored and worn out, you know? Um, yeah. That's a great. Picture, is there anything? Yeah, is there anything you're working on, or or trying to get into, or uh, have plans in, into the future that that you didn't share and you want to share here? Yeah, not uh, not necessarily. I think I think uh, you know one of the things that I'm I'm trying to work on is is uh, continued advancement of in the EV world, especially in two wheels. Um, it's, it's more challenging than four wheels. You know, there's not as much investment capital behind it. And there's some great companies making some great bikes, but, um, but it, uh, the consumer ex acceptance of, of electric and motorcycle is a lot more challenging than in, than in four wheel. Um, and, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to commit myself to, uh, um, to pushing, um, electric vehicles forward and um you know like we discussed earlier we're not quite there yet with technology but we will be there very soon and it's a great way to ride a motorcycle and it'll open a motorcycling up to a whole new group of people that don't even know what a clutch is let alone is, have never used one you know um so um I'm, I'm really looking forward to that i love what you said about arriving at work refreshed and energized and happy um cheaper than a car yeah, so for yeah. the new generation, this is yeah. not a bad choice. Parking's parking's e parking's easy, and and you know it. it and, and the reason you get there refreshes. It demands attention. Demands more attention. You know, you know, riding a motorcycle in traffic, you, it demands an attention level like a MotoGP rider. You know, with just monitoring everything that's going on around you, in addition to what you're doing with the motorcycle. Um, and, and I don't mean like speeding or you know that you know not never you know just riding normally. You just you, you, you know, I, when I ride a motorcycle, I, I pretend I'm invisible. I pretend nobody sees me and thinking about, I'm looking at every single vehicle out there and I'm, and I'm assuming they're going to do what they should not be doing and what's my escape path. And so I'm always thinking about that. So I get to work and my brain is already turned on and ready to, ready to go, you know, and, and I, and, and I ride a motorcycle uh, or a bicycle to work, you know, every single day, I try not to ever drive a car. So, yeah. On that note, though, we got to figure out is how to make our podcast digestible for the younger generation. Probably make it no, like thanks. 35 seconds long. And, uh, no, thanks. <laughs> those, 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 those younger generation, first, they need to figure out what gender they are. And <laughs> you, just, you just need Justin Bieber on the podcast, and then you guys, then you guys will. Justin Bieber is already right. old, yeah, right? Yeah, listen to anything yeah he's, yeah, he's old. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. He's already he old. old. They, they have other heroes, yeah. Taylor Swift and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, get Taylor Swift on the podcast, then you guys are you're and you're gold <laughs> off to the races. Yeah, that's all right. Well, how can people really... get in touch with you? Yeah, uh, I uh, um, reach out to me on social media. I'm on Instagram, a Leisner. Um, I uh, I'm on I'm on TikTok, but not necessarily as a creator. Um, uh, I create I create pictures of my dog. That's about that's about the, the limit of my TikTok creations. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time on Instagram at, uh, a Leisner, um, reach out there. Love to, love to chat and LinkedIn. Yeah. I LinkedIn as well. A Leisner also. Yeah. Andy Leisner. Um, on LinkedIn. Sounds good. All right, well, All I'm right. already following you. So there you go. Seen the dog. Yeah. This has <laughs> been another episode of edge group podcast. Thank you guys for listening.